for attending this webinar Green Carbon Series. I, uh, as Christian mentioned before, I'm Jorge Lopez Ordobas, a PhD student at Aston University in Ebri with Katie Chong and Professor Tony Bridgewater. And I'm going to explain a bit about the principles of the <coughs> kinetic study for pyrolysis. So I will give a bit background, a bit introduction. Why is this important? I will explain a bit what's pyrolysis, the products, uh, a bit of my pro of my project, which is the uh, the design of a pyrolysis reactor. Then we will go straight into the kinetics. We will see the result, some comparison with the actual experiments, other cases as the RDF because it's a bit special, and what I want you to know from this presentation. So just to start, we all know about the problems we are facing nowadays in the society, all the world problems with the fossil fuels, the climate change, uh, increasing energy demand, but also the waste, which is becoming a problem with the landfill. So a very good approach that we're using in green carbon is trying to convert these wastes into energy. When we talk about waste, we, talk, we not only we talk about the municipal solid waste, the normal waste that we are producing in the households, but also all the agricultural residues, wood waste, forest residues, energy crops, or maybe also animal manure. Besides, of course, the proper municipal solid waste that can be classified then into RDF. We are focusing here in Aston in following the thermochemical conversion route. So ideally, the energy, the process that we, want to, that we are going to use should be renewable, should be flexible with feedstocks, so it could be adapted to many different feedstocks. And we should produce energy or some fuel to produce energy. So we've got two different technologies that fit in the middle of them. So gasification can be renewable and it can be used to produce energy, and also, but also fuel. And combustion, it's very flexible and we produce energy, as we know, but it's, contro it's a bit controversial against uh, if it's renewable or not. So we have, a, we have a one process called pyrolysis, which could be a good solution because it's renewable. It can be flexible with the feedstock or it can produce fuel or energy. But what's pyrolysis? Well, this is an scheme about py what pyrolysis does. So we have here the feedstock, the raw material, and then we increase the temperature, but the important thing is that we do it in the absence of oxygen to have these three products, the char, the bio oil, and the gas. The proper definition is the thermochemical decomposition of the feedstock in the, in the absence of oxygen, so which, which basically means increasing the temperature in the reactor, but with no oxygen content to avoid any oxidation. This process is going to give us three products, the char, the bio oil, or also, also called condensable vapors, and the gases, but also called the permanent gases. There are three different types of pyrolysis, fast, intermediate, and slow, depending on the heating rate, the vapors, uh, and solid residence time, but also the reactor temperature. There are some limits, there are some overlapping between them. There can be also some overlapping between other processes like torrefaction and slow pyrolysis regarding the heating rate or the temperature especially. But normally we attend that fast pyrolysis is associated with very high heating rates, short vapor residence time, and very high temperature. Whereas a slow pyrolysis is mostly related to low heating rates, uh, longer vapors and solid residence times in the reactor, and finally lower reaction temperatures. These are the three products we can obtain. So, First, we have tar. It's in the green carbon project, we are focusing a lot on this product because it's also carbon. It has many different applications. If you have been here for the other webinars, you have seen other presentations, like the one from my colleague Sabina, where she was speaking about possible uses of the tar as well from a, from a different process. So mainly we can use it as soil remediation, energy production. We used to sequester the carbon instead of releasing it into the atmosphere, but also we can use to uh, absorb some liquids or gases into the char itself. Then we have the bio oil. It's this substance, a liquid substance. It can have, depending on the water content and the process, it can have two phases. As we see here, we see uh, an organic phase here in this dark brown, but also 
we have a, a cool space down here and we use it for energy and heat production or other chemical applications such as the substitute for phenols in boot resins. And finally, we've got the gas. So the gas is mostly used for energy production and it's really difficult to store. So most of the times we burn the gas to uh, provide heat to the process because we're talking about high temperatures, like as I mentioned before, I don't, uh, seven, 700 degrees is kind of the maximum limit, but we're talking about 300 to 700. Those are those need a those, those temperatures need a source of energy. So what, what am I working on? I'm working on the design of a pyrolysis reactor, of a slow pyrolysis reactor. In this case, uh, from all the technologies that we have in the industry and I saw in the literature so far, I did a classification and I found out that the rotary kiln, like the one we have here, is the most promising technology according to my criteria. So this reactor consists of a bit of solids of the, of the feedstock that transforms from the normal feedstock at the beginning to the char at the end. So this part would be the, the end of the reactor, this part would be the beginning. And then on the, mean, on the process to the end, uh, it creates some gases, some, va some vapor from the, from, pyrolysis, from the feedstock. These gases are both condensable and non-condensable vapors. The thing is that they are together inside due to the high temperatures. It's later in the post-treatment where they are separated and, and, and separate, separated into gas and liquid. Uh, so this reactor is a cylindrical shell, normally a stainless steel or depending on the process, but it can be a steel and it's rotating and it's heated up externally uh, by some source of energy. It can be some combustion gases from the, from the uh, combustion of the gases that we obtain inside. It can be burning some biomass, some external fuel, maybe electric heating, firing directly, firing directly the reactor because we cannot fire it inside because we need and the absence of oxygen, as I mentioned before. So during my, during my design, I took into account mainly, but there are other, other sources of other parts of information. I took mainly uh, three parts. First of all, the bed of solids. We saw the bed of solids in the picture before. It's not, uh, it's not a, uh, an easy thing to calculate because there is a profile and we need to see how the solids interact with the wall. But also we need to know how it's heating up. The most important part is that the particle in the middle of the bed of solids reaches the temperature that we want. Because if that particle reach, reaches that, all the, the whole bed of solids will reach it. And it will mean that we are making, we make, we make sure that we are reaching the average temperature. And finally, we also need the kinetic model in any chemical reactor. The kinetic, the kinetic part is a, is a crucial part of the research. And that's the bit I'm going to explain to you today, how to do it. So how we're, what we are doing here is trying to find a kinetic constant that transforms the feedstock, that tells us how the feedstock is transformed into char, bio oil, and gas, the three products. But we are just taking one, but it's such a complex process that we want to take only that kinetic constant is enough to us to ensure the full conversion of the process. And then the kinetics uh, will be, the amount of volatiles will be determined in another, uh, from, another method, from other methods. So just to refresh a bit, a bit the memory of all of us talking about kinetics. Uh, we are following this expression, the, <coughs> sorry, the variation of the conversion with the time, which is the kinetic, where, which is equal to the kinetic constant by a function of the conversion. This conversion depends on the reaction order, marked here with the, with the letter N, which uh, uh, shows the influence of the remaining feedstock concentration on the reaction rate. And then the letter alpha is the conversion. So it's the amount of weight that it has been lost already divided by the total amount of weight. So it's yeah, how much it has been, been converted, how much uh, what's the variation uh, compared to the final one? So how much is it still is it still left to react and to convert into the products? So the, the constant, the reaction constant, as we mentioned before, is <clears throat> it's one of the 
<coughs> oh, sorry. It's the factor that measures the rates at which the reaction occurs and it varies with the temperature using the Arrhenius, the Arrhenius law. Uh, the Arrhenius law is this one that we have here. So it's, it says, it correlates the, the kinetic constant to the pre-exponential factor and the activation energy that are totally defined by the feedstock. Then we have the global gas constant and also the temperature. So the influence of the temperature is quite big. And as I put in this paragraph here, the three parameters we want, we want to know from it from its reaction are the reaction order that we had on the other on the other on the slide before, the exponential factor, and also the activation energy. But not not only that. Also, in some cases, we will see that at the end there there is more than one step. So we need to cover one more than one step. So this study should be done for every single step that we can that we can uh, detect on the on the process. How do we do this? How do we analyze the kinetics of this of this process. So we have mainly two methods. We can use an isothermal method to study the degradation of the feedstock at a continuous temperature. But the main problem here is that in this in this reactor, since there isn't so high uh, heating rates, because we go from ambient temperature to three, four, five hundred degrees, we are having all, also some issues like mass and heat transfer. So it, there, can, there can be some limitations regarding that. And also another problem is that one experiment means only one temperature. So you don't know to what extent you can expand, dot, expand the, that information to other temperatures rather than that. And then on the other side, we've got isoconversional, which means a study the degradation of the feedstock at a constant heating rate within a temperature range. In that way, we achieve broader, uh, broader range temperatures, and it only accounts for the Paris kinetics. However, the isothermal is more realistic, but takes into account other processes uh, such as a, dif a mass diffusion within the within the feedstock, or maybe the pro problem with limitations of mass transfer. Uh, in our case, since we wanted a wider conversion and we only wanted to study the pure kinetics we select we chose to to use the isoconversional method and there are there are four there are four methods to cal to calculate the the two parameters so the ones that we want to, to calculate are the activation energy and also the exponential factor how do we do it we do it with a uh, we do it with a graphic well, with a graph. So for its conversion, most of the time, uh, we take the temperature and the heating rate and we plot together. I will explain for each, for each of them. So in, ten, in Kissinger, for example, uh, there is only a single value for activation area and exponent, uh, exponential factor for the whole reaction. So it doesn't matter if your conversion is 0 0.1 or 0 0.9, the value is, gonna, is going to be the same because it takes into account one divided by, by Tm. This Tm is the temperature at which the, conver the, the differential of conversion with the time is maximum. So it takes, it takes the, temp the variation of te the temperature where the mass variation is maximum. That's why it only takes into account one temperature. And it, it's quite similar. I mean, it's similar in all the samples of an heating rate, but it also slightly changes. That's why we can take a value. Then we've got the Kissinger-Akahira-Sunose method, the KAS, which accounts for the heating rate and the temperature at which the conversion changes from the values you are studying. You establish some values. Let's say, for example, normally you take 0 0.1, 0 0.2, up to 0 0.9. And then you see the temperature at which, at which that conversion changes and gets into one of those values. So we have 10 different temperatures for the conversions 0 0.1 up to 0 0.9. 0 0.9. And then you represent them graphically depending on the heating rate. So for each conversion, you for each conversion value, you use the three heating rates, and then all together you will have, you we will have the results. We will see in a, in a minute. 
Then the Flynn Walosawa method is quite similar, but instead of dividing the, the heating rate by the temperature at which the conversion is achieved, it's, just, it's only the heating rate and the temperature is here. We have here the, finish, the legend of the, of the processes, of the, of the different methods. And finally, Freeman is a bit different because it's true that it takes the, temp, the inverse of the temperature again, but instead of using the heating rate, it's using the variation, the variation of, the, of the conversion with the time. We will not see in the future, but I, I want to tell you now that the reaction order, which was one of the things that it's influencing the process, as we mentioned, and it will be a study. Uh, is it taken into account here? I hope you can see it. Uh, this n number, and also in the g, since the f a function of alpha is here, it's also taken here. So it has an influence on the exponential factor, because once we represent all this data in the graph, it all folds. All of them follow the express, follow the expression uh, y equal to n plus n multiplied by the x. So we have y and x, and then we we solve those equations afterwards. So how do we do this? So the experiments are usually done with the, TG, with the TGA, which stands for thermogrammetric analysis. Uh, it's a device, it's a tool that contains a chamber where the temperature is fully controlled. And we adjust, we adjust the heating rate, the temperature, final temperature, the initial one from 40 degrees. And it keeps measuring the sample the weight of the sample when, it, when it's degrading, when it's decomposing, and when part is produced. This, for example, this is an example of a, an actual TGA of one of my, of my experiments. So the continuous lines is the percentage, percentage of remaining weight of the of sample of the, com, of the remaining conversion. Because in this case, it's not, it's not that we have like 0% of sample, but it's totally, com, it's totally converted. And then the, these discontinuous lines, these three, lighter lines are the variation of the are the variation of the conversion with the time and finally the colors depend on the heating rate so it's one kelvin per minute 2.5 kelvin per minute and five kelvin per minute and you wish in this case that this in the middle uh, represents the cellulose and hemicellulose degradation within the feedstock but also we see that they don't they don't account for this degradation at the end. That's why, because that's because it's lignin degradation and it's different. So once we have this data and we see when the conversion 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 4, up to 0 0.9 is achieved, we have different temperatures here. Once we have those temperatures, we can apply, we can apply the methods that we have seen to analyze the process. We obtain this kind of data. So it's only from 10% to 70% because after 60% after the data it's increasing, but at the same time the values are not reliable because there are some, there are some really not, uh, there are some, for example, negative values for the activation energy, which should be the opposite. You should need to uh, add some energy for paralysis to occur. So we see that all of them remain quite constant for for this feedstock, for a wheat straw feedstock. And I use this, I use these uh, graphs to compare all the values. But also happens the same for the logarithm of the exponential factor. Why am I, am I using the logarithm? Because the exponential factor, it's varying in terms of magnitude order. So we have, we can see here from 10 to the 20, but also we have here, for example, 10 to the 32, so it's impossible to have it in a single graph. All of them with the different methods and varying on the conversion. So from this, we will obtain all the values of the exponential factor and activation energy, but how do we know that they are good factors, they are good parameters to calculate the actual value to, to estimate paralysis? And also the reaction order, of course, and because you keep changing the reaction order until the curve fits as much as possible. But how do we how do we compare? How do we know that the values were using are reliable? Well, we have the experimental curve. Here, the continuous lines are the no, sorry, the discontinuous lines are the experimental the experimental curves, so the ones you don't see, because they are covered by the model lines. 
So that's how we compare. We, we try to compare how much the value should be on each point of the, of the data we have, of the temperature that the TGA is giving to us. How much it should be with, compared to how much it is actually for the model. And that gives us an idea. And then we can keep changing the reaction order until it, it matches as much as possible. However, we still have a, we still have some issues because we have seen here that I just I just I have I have just showed you one step. Although in the process there were clearly two. Well, it's not it's not possible to measure the second step because the values, as I mentioned, are not giving logical results, but more strange results like negative activation energies, or the or giving some uh, logarith uh, logarithm of a negative number, which is impossible of course but for example if we go to another case to the refuse dry fuel uh, the, this feedstock the refuse dry fuel is the municipal solid waste to which you have removed the glass the metal and other non-reactive substances and also some recy some recycl recyclable fractions so we see here it's quite, it's quite different from the one before don't we so we start having here a first peak as we have before from cellulose and hemicellulose. But then we have the second peak, it's plastics. We see there is a, a second, a clear second peak, but also on the on the graph, we see there is one slope and then it changes the it changes the reaction because there is something weird. Well, it's due to the plastics. But at the same time, we cannot forget that there is a there's a step with the link in degradation because it comes here with the plastic but then it doesn't stay totally flat, but keeps decreasing. So in this case, I'm not going to show you the results, but in this case, we need to take into, ac we need to take into account at least two steps, if there's no possibility to study the third one as we have, as it happened before. So what do I want to, what do I want you to take home with this presentation? Well, we have seen Paris as a very complex process there are, there are like thousands of reactions involved. There are loads of components involved. For the later for the bio oil, there are, it's also a mixture of many many different liquids. And also, it's important to know that depend, depending on the region, the same type of feedstock can result in different kinetic parameters because also the results, the the products, can be different. In this work, we have used a black box black black box approach. Sorry where each feedstock has different parameters as solutions. So we took the, we take the feedstock as a whole instead of dividing them into the components like lignin, cellulose, and hemicellulose. In this black box approach, we have two different, two different methods. We can use the isothermal or isoconversional, and we saw there are different advantages and disadvantages. And then we saw there are, even if we take isoconversional, we still have different methods to calculate the activation energy and the exponential factor. And finally, each reaction step should be studied independently. So from one to another, even if it's the same feedstock, every, everything changes. It, the reaction order, the exponential factor, and the activation energy. And that's all from my part for today. So if you have any question, any comment, or you want to drop me an email or something, please don't hesitate to do it. Thank you.